Man, man, man. So it's looking like what I said about Stephen A. Smith, Brian Whitehurst, and the other media pawns came true. I said that they are going to start creating narratives about LeBron James and J.J. Reddick's new podcast. I did two videos so far covering that and highlighting Stephen A. Smith hating on LeBron James and J.J. Reddick's new podcast, throwing some shade when he made these comments after their first episode had aired. Let's check it out again right here. Stephen A. Smith created his own narrative about LeBron James and J.J. Reddick podcast. So what happens is when you get with somebody like a J.J. who knows the game, who's a brilliant basketball mind, but can be a bit truculent or acerbic at times when somebody he believes is ignorant is in his face talking about the game, to have a voice like that serves LeBron in a multitude of ways. It's a brilliant move on LeBron James' part. Very slick. And it will work like heaven against everybody except me. Okay, so Stephen A. Smith reacted to episode two of their podcast. LeBron James and J.J. Reddick, they had a conversation about the Dallas Mavericks and the Miami Heat series in 2011. Of course, we all know the Heat fell short. LeBron James underperformed. And to this day, you know, that's something that he said that he regrets falling short. But he also showed the Dallas Mavericks some love. He gave their coaching staff some love. And he took full accountability as well for the Heat falling short in that series in 2011. So Stephen A. Smith reacted to that, right? And this dude took out the clip of LeBron James taking full accountability just so he can chase some clout, get some clicks on his YouTube channel, and call LeBron James out. And then at the end of his video, he threw in Michael Jordan, of course, throwing in the same old media tactics, same old stuff Stephen A. Smith has been doing. And yeah, like I said, man, got to watch out for these guys because they're going to continue creating narratives based off of this podcast. So I would like to highlight what Stephen A. Smith did, and then I'll come back with some commentary. And then I'll show you guys the full clip of what LeBron James said that Stephen A. Smith and his team purposely had cut out just so they can call out LeBron James, man. So let's check out this clip right here. Here's the video. Be sure to hit that like button for me if you haven't already. That helps this YouTube channel continue to grow. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Stay up to date with all of my current YouTube videos. Peace. Let me move on, okay? Because I don't know whether or not y'all have checked out LeBron's new podcast, Mind the Game, with the one and only J.J. Reddick. To say this, let me get this out of the way. It's pretty damn good. I give both of them mad credit for it. We should all watch it. We want to hear about the subject of basketball. Those are two brothers worth listening to, no doubt about it. But that doesn't mean that occasionally LeBron don't get on my damn nerves or he won't get on my damn nerves because he said something this week that caught my attention about his early years with the Miami Heat, meaning year one in Miami and talking about filling out that roster around him with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Before I even go any further with my opinion, which I will openly confess, piss me off. Take a listen to this clip, please. Courtesy of 342 Productions and Uninterrupted. Check this out. My first year in Miami. Yeah, we had a big three. And everyone said it's a super team, super team, a super team that but we had to build our team around all minimum guys, which was still OK, but we didn't fill out the complimentary guys enough. Yeah, we had Rio. We had Udonis, you know, but we didn't we didn't have enough as far as enough complimentary guys to actually make it all work. And we still made it to the finals. We still made it to the finals and we still probably should have won the finals. But I still give credit to you. Listen, it is what it is. You, you win and you lose and we lost. There's no Dallas was fucking good and they hit it. They hit a stride at the right time. Dirk was unbelievable. Um, but my second year, we was able to grab some complimentary players and role players that really just, I'm talking about super superstars in their roles. LeBron James, that is some straight bullshit. You got to be kidding me. I know that you didn't just say that with the cameras rolling. That's bullshit. Somebody got to say it, so I'm going to say it. Now, let's get this out of the way right now. Put up the roster that LeBron is alluding to. LeBron is telling the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Joel Anthony, Carlos Arroyo, Mike Bibby, Mario Chalmers. By the way, Mario Chalmers could play. Eric Dampier, Udonis Haslam. Udonis Haslam was young, a young girl considerably at that particular moment in time. He wasn't some has-been, okay? Eddie House could shoot. Jawan Howard, Zadrunas Ogorskis, James Jones, Jamal Maglio, Mike Miller, Dexter Pittman. I don't know why Jerry Stackhouse was on there. He's only there for a month. He wasn't on the roster in the NBA Finals. LeBron... You want to make the argument about your roster. 
I totally understand. But you see, this is why I respect the man. I revere the man. He's number two on the Mount Rushmore all time. He ain't the GOAT. This is the reason why. I hope you're listening, Shay Shay. LeBron James and the Miami Heat, with that roster, were up 2-1 on the Dallas Mavericks before lo losing three straight. Do you know that LeBron James in game four scored zero points in the fourth quarter? Do you know that in game five, LeBron James scored two points in the fourth quarter? Do you know that in that game four, LeBron James had eight points? Eight! For a career 27 point per game scorer. For a dude that's approaching age 40 and averaging damn near 25. That LeBron James, eight points in an entire game four of an NBA Finals. 17 in game five, but only two points in the fourth quarter. And in game six, he had 21 significantly and precipitously lower than his average. This wasn't about the roster. You didn't lose to the Miami Heat because of your roster. You lost to the Miami Heat because of you. There's no way around that. I don't care about the roster. The roster didn't stop you from averaging over 25 throughout the season. The roster didn't stop you from getting to the finals. The roster didn't stop you from being up 2-1 in the finals, even when Bert Dirk Nowitzki was scoring points. What stopped you was that you were nowhere to be found in the fourth quarter. That is not something we have ever been able to say about Michael Jordan. That's why you're number two all time on the Mount Rushmore, not number one. Let's stop that nonsense. You're right about the roster, but you ain't right as to that's the reason y'all lost in the finals. Okay, so that's the clip Stephen A. Smith put out, right? So let's play a longer version of the clip that LeBron James and J.J. Reddick had put out. So let's play it right here, and then we'll be right back to talk about this, guys. So let's check it out right here. Here's the video. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to tell you when it all changed. Obviously, my first year there, you know, played great basketball, got all the way to the finals, losing the finals. I played like shit. Um, Spo is the reason why we were a better team, and our team was more assembled properly. That summer, he went to Oregon and hung out with Chip Kelly. Oh, interesting. He, he, when we lost to Dallas, he went to Oregon and hung out with Chip Kelly and learned to spread offense and tried to figure out if he could translate that to basketball. And don't know the super conversations that him and Chip had, but I know when he came back to us, he knew in order for us to reach our potential, one, I had to be fucking 10 times better than I was in that previous June finals, but Chris Bosch had to go to the five. And CB being who he is, there was no pushback. There was no pushback. He knew in order for us to reach our potential that CB would have to go to the five and we had to spread. We had to, he had to start working on his corner three faithfully every day after practice, corner three every day after practice. We're going to post you up. We're going to get you your elbow catches. The offense is going to run through you at times. But in order to bring, you know, the Tyson Chandlers out of the paint, in order to bring the Roy Hibberts out of the paint, in order to bring Tim Duncan out of the paint at times, in order to bring Kevin Garnett out of the paint, you got to hit these corner threes. You got to at least be a threat. And Spo, Spo knew it. He had that, he had that vision. He went and learned. He said, the way I, he said, the way I coached in that finals versus Dallas, unacceptable. I told myself the way I played, unacceptable. And he came back with vengeance and I was all, I, I was locked the fucking in from, from start to finish, but it was Spo. I got a question about the Bosch, Bosch spacing, but because you just said that. Was that the low point for you in your career? Oh, for sure. The 2011. Lowest. The lowest. Yeah. Yeah, the lowest. Okay, yeah. so as we can see, LeBron James took full accountability, right? And everybody in Stephen A. Smith's comment section, they were even calling him out for doing what he had did. That's disgusting to purposely clip out LeBron James stuff, take it out of context, run to your YouTube channel, call him out as if he didn't take full accountability and making it seem like LeBron James was just on his podcast trying to create a narrative blaming that they didn't have a good enough roster and that's why they fell short. LeBron James and J.J. Reddick talked a lot more and went deeply into the conversation more than what Stephen A. Smith and his production team had put out just to chase clicks and clout. And remember, Stephen A. Smith, when he was going at Marcellus Wiley, he said on The Breakfast Club that he doesn't have to do what YouTubers do. He said, oh, I'm Stephen A. Smith. I'm on The Breakfast Club. I don't have to do what these guys do on YouTube. My name rings bells. So now look at Stephen A. Smith doing exactly what he was trying to say Marcellus Wiley was doing on his YouTube channel. 
when Marcellus Wiley was calling him out for how he had handled the situation with Max Kellerman and how Stephen A. Smith wouldn't shut up about it, writing it in books, constantly talking about it before Max Kellerman got fired. And then after Max Kellerman got fired, Stephen A. Smith kept talking about it for years and years. And then Marcellus Wiley and Jason Whitlock and people were calling Stephen A. Smith out. And Stephen A. Smith said, I don't have to do what they do on YouTube. I don't need to take stuff out of context and chase clicks. And they have to do that because they don't have a name like me. You said what you said several times. You wrote about it in your book. You talked about, you know, your experience with Max Kellerman working mm -hmm. on the show. Mm -hmm. And I saw a reaction from uh, Marcellus Wiley. And he mm -hmm. said, you got rid of Max Kellerman because Max wasn't dumb and white. Okay. Well, let me say this. I'm not talking about, I'm going to address that last part. Mm -hmm. The first part, I'm not addressing it anymore, and here's the reason why. Some people want to do anything for clicks. Y'all don't have to do that. I don't have to do so that. So look at Stephen A. Smith now, man. Mm, mm, mm. So that's it for today's video, guys. I just wanted to highlight that, man. Y'all get in the comment section down below. I would love to hear y'all thoughts about today's video. Don't forget to hit that like button if you made it this far in the video. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well. Comment down new sub if you're a new sub. Catch you guys on the next video, and we out, guys. Peace.